All right, good morning, everyone. Please welcome Jeff Brown from Lantana Consulting Group to discuss automating prior auth and much more. All right, well, thank you all for <laughs> show, showing up for this. I know this is a, a topic that seems to generate a lot of interest. Uh, first of all, can you hear me okay standing back like this? Okay, good. <clears throat> all right, so a little bit of level setting and just kind of set expectations to start with about the presentation. Uh, if I talked about burden reduction to the depths that many would like, we would be here at least until 8 o'clock tonight. So, uh, First of all, I will be telling you who I am and why I'm here speaking about this. Uh, a very brief overview of what DaVinci is, very brief, uh, and then of course dive right into burden reduction. Um, the implementation guides that are in, involved, uh, what their roles are, what the workflows are, kind of a high level to medium depth on some of those things, and we can dive into Q&A at the end, as you see. And I said hopefully, because hopefully we don't get sidetracked by too many questions early on. What's out of scope? Okay, specific pieces of data being exchanged. So what I mean by that is really, um, we're not gonna get into the resource elements being used, we're not gonna get into extensions because if, if you looked into this at all, you know that there's uh, some pretty hefty extensions that are critical pieces in the flow. But just understand that they're being addressed in a higher level view. Uh, and I won't be giving any deep dives onto the leverage technologies, CDS hooks, Smart on Fire, CQL, anything like that. Uh, I will be addressing them, but this is not meant to be a tutorial on CDS hooks or anything like that. So uh, just to understand. Plus, I, I kind of followed along with what DaVinci typically does, which is throw in a lot of information on slides. I know you typically don't want to do that, but uh, the point here is that you all get access to these slides. So I'll be addressing everything on here. If you want to go back and look at the slides and kind of uh, fill in the gaps or maybe add a little context to something that I said, uh, you'll have it here. So I'll, I'll let you know when those spots are. Okay, so who am I and why am I up here? Uh, so again, Jeff Brown, Healthcare Standards Advisor, Fire Subject Matter Expert at Lantana Consulting Group. Uh, first of all, I've got over 30 years of uh, software engineering and data architecture and database administration uh, experience. 25 and more of that has been actually in the healthcare space. So I did a lot of developing uh, toward electronic health record systems back in the day. I have my FHIR CDA and V3 RIM certifications, if any of that's relevant. I'm also an HL7 certified educator. Um, one that really I wanted to, to stress here is that I'm part of the technical steering committee as an implementer representative. And so I'm not going to get into really what the technical steering committee does, but as an implementer representative, if any of you are implementing these standards, technologies, uh, anything that you're hearing at Dev Days, then I'm supposed to be your advocate, and I want to be your advocate. So it really does matter what your voices are, and we hear those. I'm also co-chair of a couple different work groups, financial management and what we call ITS at HL7. Uh, and probably most relevant to this presentation is that I'm a member of uh, DaVinci's Burden Reduction Core Leadership Team, and I'm a, the lead author on documentation, templates, and rules. Excuse me. So why the DaVinci project? So. A fire accelerator, as many of you know, uh, is uh, a group in a certain space that's trying to advance the use of fire to help healthcare and advance um, that particular area within healthcare. And Da Vinci is value-based care. If you want to summarize it, it's value-based care. Okay, so that's the purpose of what we do in Da Vinci. We have a ton of different use cases that uh, are all over the place, but. Burden reduction being, you know, one of those. 
So just real briefly, I want to show you the uh, spaces that we have within DaVinci, and you'll see where we're falling in this uh, presentation for burden reduction. Uh, one space is clinical data exchange. You'll see the IGs there, and uh, you can go back and look at the maturity levels and, and so forth. Uh, foundational assets, the ones that are like the core pieces of what the rest of the DaVinci guides do. Uh, quality and risk, obviously another topic that's becoming more and more relevant. And then, of course, coverage, transparency, and burden reduction. And you'll see that this is where our three core implementation guides come into play with and a little adjunct to what we call CDEX. And I'll be getting into that a little bit more uh, as we get into this uh, to understand the uh, different implementation guides and how CDEX is more of a, an additional technology leveraged just like CDS hooks. So many uh, are aware of the latest CMS final rule, CMS 0057-F, okay? This indicates, as you can see from the table in the legend, uh, which one of the standards are actually mandated. And in the bottom one, the implementation guides uh, for particular use cases and different APIs that are actually recommended. So just a, a few thoughts on that. Uh, CMS did not do this in a vacuum, okay? They coordinate really closely with ONC and what ONC's guidelines have been so that uh, all this kind of meshes together really, really nicely. CMS strongly recommends leveraging the recommended guides, okay? Um, and whether it's the implementation guides in addition to the ONC um, mandated uh, fire standards, um, they strongly, and I, I want to emphasize, strongly recommend these implementation guides. And what I mean by strongly is, um, if it's recommended, I think most of us that have dealt with uh, the federal regulations in the past realize that that means that it's a heads up that these are probably going to be mandated before too long. And CMS is fully aware that uh, some of this is like a moving target. We're actually uh, working continually, taking the feedback, iteratively going through and, and advancing these standards and uh, improving upon them. So um, it's not set in stone by any means, but uh, we're getting a lot more stability as time goes on. And as you see at the bottom there, there's our three core IGs. Okay, so this is why we're here. What is burden reduction? So just out of curiosity, how many in the room are, is really familiar with what burden reduction is about? Okay. Um, it's kind of a mixture, but that's a loaded question anyway, because what is burden reduction? And burden reduction uh, is unique. Uh, there's a lot of things unique about burden reduction, uh, but one of them is that the use case is not correlated to any one specific implementation guide. It's a set or a suite of implementation guides that uh, allow us to solve this problem within healthcare. Um, there are three distinct implementation guides, the core ones that I just spoke of, which we'll be going through in more depth, uh, but you'll notice too that I do throw in CDEX there because it is critical to one particular uh, part of the workflow. These implementation guides do provide us with uh, a lot of modular usability and value that's even outside of prior authorization. Granted, pri excuse me. Granted, prior authorization is really the the core use case that most everyone's interested in, and what is actually um, probably the dominant uh, thing that you're hearing about these days. But um, a lot of the people will ask me, uh, why do you not have just one massive implementation guide to handle prior authorization? Well, the modularity of this allows us to grow beyond just prior authorization and leverage in other pieces, but some of that will become more evident as we get through this. <clears throat> and the uh, IGs that uh, are in the core uh, spec of burden reduction as we look at it as a whole is actually, uh, there's a lot of similar capabilities in, in certain pieces, uh, I'll point those out, but they're very distinct and have a very specialized scope of use. So if anybody's looked at anything regarding Da Vinci burden reduction, you've seen this. If you've been on any of the Connectathon kickoff calls, 
uh, I present this. If you've looked at any of the birds of a feather, you've seen this. This is the high level view. Okay, so we have the three core pieces, coverage requirements discovery. So I'll be referring to this like most of us do as CRD, documentation templates and rules, DTR, and prior authorization support, PAS. Okay, and this will show on the left, the, um, you know, the left, the fact that the, there's a, pay, a provider side going to the payer side, as everyone pretty much knows. And then you'll see down here outside of that uh, core piece of burden reduction, we stick in uh, CDEX because uh, the clinical data exchange, because as you will see, becomes a very important part of the functionality for prior authorization. I do want to also point out this one piece right here in the middle that you see in between the, the two sides, the provider and the payer side of prior authorization support, uh, where we call out X12. Okay, this has been uh, a part of uh, the design for a long time because of a HIPAA law that uh, requires that at some point in a transaction, it would have to be an X12 format for 278. Um, I'll be getting into something called the enforcement discretion and the impact that that has on us. So, yes, I see a fist in the air and I'm, I'm all for it as well. Okay, this is one of the busy slides I was telling you about. Um, it's more of an introduction to CRD from a very high level. I won't dig into this much because I truly do want to get into the question and answers part of this, this presentation. But I will say that... Uh, the CRD, Coverage Requirements Discovery, uh, the whole purpose of CRD is what its name says, Coverage Requirements Discovery. So you can imagine that you're going into a provider, your doctor, and the doctor says, you know, I, I really think you need this particular procedure or whatever it may be. And there's a few questions that have to be answered. Look, do you have insurance? Do you have coverage for this at all? Uh, if there is coverage, will there be a prior authorization necessary? And if so, is there going to be additional documentation to support that? So a lot of pieces that have to happen. As you know, in the world today, what we see is that there's a lot of manual steps here. There's a lot of providers says, okay, you need this. Let me have someone on my staff go make a few calls, check a few things, find out, yeah, you do have coverage. All these pieces of information, very, very manual process. What we want is to not intrude upon the provider's workflow. All the way through this, we want to try to reduce that, um, reduce human interaction. We want to improve on the speed at which these things can be done and done accurately. Uh, so what happens typically is that we have, uh, as you'll see from this diagram that's up here, I'll walk through it. So let's say the provider orders an, orders an MRI for the patient. So again, this is a very high level overview, but it does give you a sense of what's going on here. Um, so it invokes a service through something called CDS hooks. Okay, so this is the part where um, the order, the signing off of that order will actually trigger something in the background. Again, not intruding on the provider. The provider should never see this even though they're sitting there with the laptop or some device with the patient, most likely there's other workflow places, but that's a, a typical one for this scenario. Then you can see how it jumps over. It triggers that hook for the CDS hook service that's provided on the payer side or somewhere in between. And this is the, the process that goes through and makes all those determinations of your coverage, you know, what pieces of information uh, are available. Did you send me enough information to make that determination? That's always a possibility coming back. Um, after that, there's a, a response called the CDS hooks response that comes back. Then we have to, on our side, on, on the provider side, have to evaluate that response. So as you can see that uh, th where the arrow goes, that there's actually um, a possibility that there's no prior authorization requirement. You know, all the information should come back from this that you need at that point. But what happens if you do need prior authorization? That determination can be made as well. And then we can also go launch DTR. Okay, that's in the case where we decide 
um, through the CDS hooks process that there is additional documentation that's going to be required to support this to even make a determination for that prior authorization. Uh, a lot of information here, again, you'll have the access to the slides and I really hope that you can go back and, and take a look at this. It uh, really does clear things up. So basically what we've said here is, here's how we determine you have coverage. We do need uh, prior authorization and let's say we need additional documentation to support that. Okay, that is the workflow that we just now gave, which is order sign. You'll see that down near the bottom. Uh, that's where the provider actually signed off on it. You can see that these are actually different CDS hooks that can be triggered, and they fall in different places in the uh, workflow for that provider. Obviously, appointment book much earlier, uh, and then you move on down to where you do the order sign, and then even order dispatch is where it's handed off to the appropriate uh, servicing provider. One thing to remember is, as you see this interaction and go back and maybe review this at some point, remember that the information that's available to the process at any given point in this workflow can vary. There's going to be the possibility that you won't have certain pieces that you might later in the process. So that's a consideration that has to be taken into account when any CDS hook is triggered. Bless you. So again, we're looking for more documentation. We have to support this. We have to provide more information than that basic information that CRD was able to send to the payer side to determine about the need for prior authorization. Uh, again, you can review that as you would like. But DTR is this nice little black box of uh, an ability to gather and consolidate and coalesce information together and hand it off. That's important to understand the prior authorization and more part uh, because documentation templates and rules uh, can serve its function in uh, potentially many capacities. That more is still being defined as to how many different ways can we use this, but this leads into also why we don't have one massive prior authorization support guide. Um, I mean, prior authorization guide, uh, because what we uh, might want to do is use this module in other use cases eventually. So let's walk through real quickly here that let's say CRD made that determination and there was a launch of D the DTR app, okay? So we load the, uh, the context, there's gotta be a context, what patient we're dealing with and what uh, questionnaire needs to be retrieved from the payer. Uh, a lot of this ha has to take place once DTR launches, it has to go out to the payer. Uh, it's a fire operation we call questionnaire package. And what it does basically says, here's the context in which uh, I'm requesting for uh, the documentation. Uh, for a prior authorization, and then uh, what you get back is a bundle of questionnaires, one or more questionnaires, uh, any value sets, any uh, CQL libraries that might be necessary, and those CQL libraries will actually be executed against the EHR to extract information, to pre-populate as much information in those questionnaires as possible. So when that form comes up, we want to make sure that we have as little information editing and entry as uh, can be gleaned from that EHR. So we wanna make sure we do as much. So that's where the CQL comes in. Uh, again, pre-populate the questionnaire from the patient record. That's the extraction. Uh, query for missing information. That's basically going to be couldn't find this piece of information in the EHR or was not sufficient or needed to be modified then you can enter that on the form. Um, then we come to a piece that's really uh, unique. So uh, it's called adaptive forms. That's the technology we call it. It's basically based on the questionnaire. We, you know of a questionnaire, you've been hearing about that probably in several presentations at Dev Days here, uh, but a questionnaire is just a set of questions. Obviously it's a lot more complex than that. Uh, but question and answers uh, can be entered and uh, a lot of logic involved there. But it's one massive questionnaire. We have something called adaptive questionnaires. So if you're not familiar with what that is, adaptive questionnaires allow you to answer one question, send it back to the payer, and the payer can 
look at that, the payer system can look at that, make a determination as to what to ask next. So it's a very interactive process, uh, very robust, allows for a lot more capabilities because it is interactive. Remember, that's the interactive back and forth with the payer to make those determinations. And uh, in reality, we have found that one potential that we could have is that in a happy path, that that information going back and forth to the payer, the payer could say, yeah, I can already tell that you're, you know, you're going to be approved for prior authorization. So uh, that is a possibility at that point, but only through the adaptive forms piece. So if we do the adaptive, as I said, it's an interactive going back to the payer, and then you can see where it loops back around. We go through the other process with that question and do that however many times is necessary. But either way, you come to a point where you store the, the results, okay? And that goes back into the EHR, okay? This sounds very generic, mainly because it is, and it's meant to be. It's meant to be uh, generic to that point because you don't want to couple it too tightly with any other system or uh, implementation guide. It just basically says, I'm actually going to store this questionnaire response. Uh, I don't have to know what you're going to do with it. But in reality, through the prior authorization flow, the next thing you're going to do is launch PAS, prior authorization support. And uh, this is a, a diagram that's, uh, I know it looks really busy, a lot of small words on there, but you can take a look at it later. But basically, uh, this gives you a lot of the launch requirements that uh, DTR will have. So you have the, the standard, as we were explaining, CRD to DTR launch, but you can have a standalone launch. We won't get into the details of that, but it can launch outside of the context of uh, CRD. Uh, but also, there's a piece down here you'll see where it says PAS right here at the bottom. That'll become critical when we start talking about CDEX. And prior authorization support. So this sounds like it's the only piece to the prior auth uh, puzzle, but it is not. Uh, though its name uh, does sound a little bit like that, but what prior authorization support does is it's the, the workhorse of actually doing the prior auth submission. So let's take a look at a typical, it looks pretty straightforward, flow uh, of prior authorization uh, within burden reduction. And this is supporting the X12 component that we talked about before. So you'll see the provider on the left, the payer on the right, and that translation layer in between for X12, which will be translated to a 278 and then either processed by the payer as is, or it could be transformed back into fire, however it needs to be done. But these are the basic steps going to the payer for that. That's the submission of prior authorization. So you've gathered all the information, you've made the determinations up front, you've used DTR to actually uh, put together this nice little bundle of questionnaire information, questionnaire response, uh, anything that should be necessary to support our request. Now we actually submit that. We submit that to uh, the payer side, and then the payer uh, at some point, which we'll get into, uh, can come back with the response. Was it uh, approved? Was it denied? Was it pended? Meaning there's something else I need to look into from a payer, uh, the payer perspective. So that's the basic workflow with the X12 component in the middle. So now under the enforcement discretion that I mentioned before, uh, a lot of people have initially misinterpreted this enforcement discretion to mean we've removed X12, and, and we have not removed the X12 piece. As a matter of fact, there'll probably be a large call for the X12 component. But the reality is before, if you didn't use X12 in the flow somewhere, there's a penalty for it. We're saying here, you now the enforcement of that penalty, there's some discretion as to you know, any penalties that might apply, which means basically you're allowed to go straight fire. Okay, this is huge for the industry because I know that uh, while payers have a lot of uh, built-in infrastructure already in place for the X12 piece, uh, 
fire is where we're going and, and we want to be able to leverage a consistent standard uh, whenever we can. So hopefully that will progress, time will tell. Uh, but that same workflow happens, but you notice that piece in the middle is gone. We don't have a translation from fire to X12, <coughs> excuse me. We don't have to worry about whether we can convert that back or whether or not there is a, a nice mapping in place for the information. You know, that's been work that's been going on. Uh, while that needs that work needs to continue because, as I said, we're not getting rid of X12, but we're allowing you to do a full fire end to end. Uh, simplifies things tremendously, and hopefully this will become more and more adopted. So it's basically what you would expect of the sending forward and coming back from the payer. Uh, I think we're, we're looking at uh, a smoother transition now in this piece. The complexity comes back to the fact that there won't necessarily be an immediate determination made. Okay, I think anybody that's worked in, in this space at any time uh, will appreciate the fact that it's really common for it to be pended, meaning that there's more information needed or there's a more research on their part, uh, more looking into it. So this is the happy path right here that it would be immediately coming back. So new capabilities uh, within PaaS. I say new, uh, this is in the STU2, uh, that was published just a few months ago, about almost six months ago now. Um, and one of them is specifically related to how those pended responses were handled. Um, if you have been following the burden reduction story from the beginning, you will know that uh, for the longest time there, polling was our mechanism. I know that puts a shiver up my spine too whenever anyone says polling but polling is uh, not allowed anymore. Thank goodness. We have subscriptions and we have a lot of great work. If you've seen uh, some of the presentation on subscriptions that Gino Canessa has presented here at Dev Days, um, that implementation guide uh, of the R5 backport for subscriptions is critical to this because that's what's being leveraged here. Uh, and what that does is in, instead of the polling mechanism, which means that it comes back pended, the response comes back pended, and now the provider side is sitting here going, okay, they've got to do some more things on their side, on the payer side. How often do I check back to call them up and say, you know, are, is it ready? No, it's not ready. Very time consuming from a system perspective. Uh, it's, a, it's a headache. Um, so many complexities that go into it. Polling is just a bad thing. So with subscriptions, there can be a subscription uh, placed at the payer side initially, and then at any point when there's a pending response back, it's not on the provider anymore <coughs> to actually go back and keep checking on this. It's like, now the payer will let me know. It's like, I've given you the address to come back and let me know, so whenever you know something, come back. So that's where this information uh, Really, really, this advancement right here in the, the past capabilities has been so substantial. Now, I know a lot of people are interested in this piece we uh, have always called attachments, uh, the request for additional documentation. So one of those pended responses that comes back is, well, that's great what you sent me in the, in the prior auth submission, but I need a little bit more information. Okay. And... We have CDEX. CDEX, that's what it does. Uh, CDEX is clinical data exchange, so it's, it's, its whole purpose is to allow that information to go back and forth. So there's two specific use cases that can occur right here. The payer can come back and say, I need some additional documentation. That additional documentation may be found in a PDF that's stored somewhere uh, in some other format, um, whatever that format may be. And then CDEX can be launched back from PaaS and it can actually go out and uh, retrieve that information and send it back. Then that's the end of the story. Hopefully that's the only one. Uh, this came up uh, in a recent, at the last working group meeting actually, a uh, question was, okay, well what if they come back and say, well, that wasn't enough still? Well, the process just repeats. So there no, should be no confusion. It's just an iterative process until you have enough information sent back to the payer. The great thing about the modular format and design 
of burn reduction is, as I mentioned, DTR is a black box. Okay, it doesn't care necessarily how you start it up or uh, where it came from or where that data is going to. It says, you give me enough information, I'll do what I do, and then I'll give it back to you. And that's perfect here because if that pending response says additional documentation is needed and it's a questionnaire that needs to be filled out, uh, that's what DTR does. So actually we have a brand new LOINT code that was designed that comes back in that information that indicates that, oh, here's where you look to see where we can get that questionnaire, get the context together, launch DTR because that's what DTR does. This allows for the filling out of those questionnaires. So huge step forward in handling this use case. Um, of course, those questionnaires get bundled up, as we know, uh, and handed back to CDEX, which goes through the prior auth uh, resubmission of that additional documentation. There's an operation for that, uh, and we should be good. So a lot of advancements have taken place in the latest STU-2. Um, I do want to stress at this point, uh, I mentioned early on about being an implementer representative and how your voices are important. I'll give you an example. I had someone speaking to me just the day before yesterday, and uh, we were just sitting at one of the tables out here, and a question came up about, in the, in the uh, IG for CRD, it says this, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so I should still be able to do uh, this particular process. I won't get into all the details of it, but just understand that I said, no, you have to do it this way now. We've done away and deprecated that some time back, and now it's eliminated. Um, you have to do it this way. And they were like, well, it's not very clear in the guide. So I went back and reviewed it, and they were right. While it does say it, it needed to be stated in a little more uh, conformance requirements uh, language. Uh, so I entered a, a ticket. As you know, JIRA tickets are the way we advance these standards, whether it's the base spec or whether it's uh, these implementation guides. Uh, and so another thing that uh, we hopefully will uh, refine, make better for the implementers because the implementers are not the ones that are in the weeds all the time with us, okay? Sometimes um, I use the analogy of anybody that's been a developer, when we write our own code, we're the worst ones to be testing it necessarily because we know how it should work. And uh, we can try our best to make it break, but in the back of our minds, we know how it works. Same thing when we're developing these implementation guys. We know how the process should work. It's in our minds. We try to think of all scenarios, and I think we, we do as good a job as humanly possible, but still, it's not until you throw that out to somebody else that doesn't have all that context, doesn't have all that background, that they start identifying where the issues are. So involvement in this process uh, from all of you and from anyone that uh, is going to be leveraging this is, is critical. I can't, I can't overstate that. Uh, here's your eye test for the day. Uh, it's, it is small, granted. Um, definitely not walking through all of this because uh, this is the more detailed view of CRD, DTR to PAS, and even so, the uh, light greenish-blue boxes on either side show pieces that can't be represented on this diagram. So it's very complex when you get down into the weeds. That's why we're not going that deep on this in this presentation. But I throw it in here and do have a link to it uh, online on Confluence uh, where you can zoom up on it. But it, it really does help because you can see in these pinkish boxes here. These are the ex actual external exchanges. So we look at all this information flowing back and forth, but uh, sometimes it's hard to know what are the parts that are actually being exchanged across the wire outside of one entity versus another entity. And, and that's what we're seeing right here. And then even down here at the bottom, um, you see there, there's the uh, impacted CMS enforcement discretion uh, piece. That's the X12 part that we're not doing away with. We're just allowing you to step aside and, and actually just do straight fire if you want. Trust me, I'll keep repeating that so that we don't have any co confusion. Uh, and then the benefits from uh, burn reduction. Interoperability, that's why we're all here. That's what we do. Uh, 
we want to standardize the way that these interactions take place. We have to have as consistent and uh, manageable and understandable specifications. Uh, as I mentioned, they have to be clear. If you come in as an implementer that knows fire, but doesn't know the use case necessarily, you should be able to take these implementation guides and do a pretty good job of getting these implemented. You know, maybe not perfectly, it is, it is complicated, but uh, there's always room for improvement. But interoperability is uh, the, the key part of this. But also the workflow, as I mentioned, we want to automate as much of this as possible. We want to be able to leverage these pieces in other use cases if necessary, like DTR does this great thing about uh, gathering the uh, questionnaire information, pre-populating that, and, and presenting a form, and, and all this wonderful stuff. That's why we don't just have prior authorization as a whole, because CRD does its thing, it benefits from DTR, and then PAS does its thing. All together, they make up the burden reduction solution. Uh, but there's nothing to say that we can't use one of those in another context if necessary. Uh, with that being said, for prior authorization, putting them all together improves the workflow, reduces how many times uh, a human has to interact with a, a screen to actually get this information back and forth. And no phones, no walking back and pulling charts. Eliminate so much of that. Uh, obviously, the privacy and security part. Uh, always comply with the HIPAA requirements. That's part of what we were dealing with before. Uh, and then actual burden reduction. Avoid duplicate entry. Um, make it easier to adapt to different workflows. Uh, that, these are all things that we're considering as we build these out. Uh, again, I'm part of uh, a team of very talented people. I'm glad they let me in on this to work on um, the different pieces of this and a larger community that's contributing you guys are the, the subject matter experts that are implementers that come to our calls. Please join our calls. That's what we're all about. So here's some more of that information that hopefully will be valuable to you. Again, feedback and Q&A. So. Oh. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. Uh -huh. Can you go into a little bit more detail on some of the components on the payer side? Are, how many of these are requirements under the new regulations versus recommendations from the implementation guide? For example, the subscriptions, um, those pieces, are these part of the regulations where the payers must support this, or is this just what we are recommending the payers to do? Can you differentiate a bit between regulation versus recommendation? No, that, that's actually a really good clarification question, uh, because I mentioned early on about uh, the implementation guides being uh, what's recommended. Um, so whether or not the, the, the implementation guide as a whole is recommended, or whether it's going to be mandated, or when it becomes mandated, the key thing here is what are the requirements within a specific implementation guide. Um, those conformance requirements are, are what have to be dealt with. It will be very clear, hopefully, uh, within an implementation guide that this is what happens on the client side or the provider side. This is what is required of the payer side. So the purpose of this implementation guide is how do we implement this solution and this solution should be very specific and very clear about which pieces are required on which side. So um, I give that as a, a, the, basically the beginning of this answer because uh, it's not granular inside of the uh, implementation guide. If, if there's optionality, it'll be called out within that implementation guide. Uh, in a, other words, uh, the conformance language, um, if we say something should be done, the all caps should, that you should do this process. Well, granted, that's, that means you don't have to do that, but be aware that there may be some repercussions if you don't. So if it says that the payer should be doing this, they don't have to, but there could be complications along the way. So the shells are, are much better um, because it's a little clearer, but uh, the reality is that we can't just constrain everything down that tightly. So to answer uh, in a more succinct way, um, the 
payer side versus the provider side should all be encapsulated within the implementation guide itself. So those requirements are what you go by, and that, that's what should make this an easier process to implement is because all the parties involved should be able to tell what their requirements are from that guide. Is that helpful? Yes. If I miss something, just let me know. Because <laughs> the way that those questions come across sometimes are different than what <laughs> you meant. I think what she was asking is, is the polling is that the specific technology? That, that is one of the components. So just thinking about, like, if we're okay. creating a, developing a solution. Oh, sorry. Like, if we're developing a solution for yeah. prior auth, right? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we have to develop for subscription-based? Do we have to develop for payers that don't do subscriptions so we're building in polling? You know, just those technical components based That's on That's actually a really good uh, call-out in terms of a, a, a very specific piece that uh, is part of your question uh, because the polling has been eliminated. Okay, so we, we, we don't want polling at all. You shall support. I mean, if you implement polling, okay, but that's fine, but you have to support subscriptions. So, okay. you know, it's more of an additional thing. There's a lot of things you can do in addition. As long as you're conforming to what the guide says you have to do, you're good. You can do all these other pieces, but that's not part of the requirements. So polling is is really out, okay? Uh, the requirement is the subscriptions. You have to do that. So whether you also support polling, that's outside of the scope of what the guide is actually defining, but it's saying um, there will be cases where it says you shall not do this, you shall do this. Those are the things you have to watch for. Okay, thanks for the clarification. The is specifically inside the PADS IG. Yes. It's not in security. Uh, right, right. The polling is, is strictly currently, uh, the polling has been strictly in the past and the subscriptions now uh, solely within PAS because it has to do with those pended responses coming back. Because once that comes back, you know the payer's doing something that may take an hour, may take seven days. How often do I check back? I don't want to have to keep going back to them. So just leave the uh, requirement on the payer side to come back and and let me know when you're ready. So, uh, Thanks, Jeff. Uh, one, of the, one of the things you mentioned early on was the don't interrupt the clinician's workflow. So I'm envisioning the doctor s gets the order, a, a hook fires off, they're done fat and happy, they don't care. The rest of the stuff's left to the administrative staff. Uh -huh. So where does that subscription go back to? Is there some s smart app that uh, administrative staff checks on to see whether these, you know, the prior odds have pended and need more documentation are done? How, where does that happen? Okay, uh, so yeah, that's a good question. And you have to realize that a lot of these pieces can be implementation specific and how um, a specific uh, organization or group of um, exchange parties decide on using this. Let me give you an example. And it ha it's not uh, about the pended responses, but it has to do with actually CRD launching DTR. So it is DTR having a form for you. Uh, in the past, what we used to do is uh, there's something called CDS hooks uh, cards, okay? And so it was like, okay, the way you're going to handle this is uh, once CRD does its thing and, and determines, hey, you will need to launch DTR to get more information, it would uh, provide a card, which means you're going to get a dialog box on your screen, and it's going to provide a link to launch that app. Uh, providers hate that because that would pop up immediately. And so they're sitting here talking to the patient and all this is going in the background so they don't even realize really that CRD is doing all the CDS hooks back and forth. So they're just sitting here doing their business all of a sudden they're popped up with this and click on that and now a form pops up. So the remedy for that was we do something called system actions, okay? System actions eliminates the need for uh, a card to pop up and it comes back with all the information necessary to launch DTR. But since it's happening in the background, the implementation can decide at what point that that form needs to be filled out. So uh, I, I don't guess they mind me mentioning this because they brought it up at uh, one of our presentations at uh, the Connectathon, uh, but Epic actually will hold on to that. And I think most will. 
in terms of that CRD uh, determination is going to be back and it comes back with that system action, they're not going to just throw that form up because imagine a, a provider all of a sudden getting a, a 40 question form pop up in the middle of what they're doing. So they hold on to it a little bit and uh, actually leverage that. They keep that information, they leverage that to give the form probably to the back office. Okay, but again, that's the implementation uh, guys, the, the, that's out of the scope of what the implementation guides themselves. They provide you the ability to do it and, and pop those up anytime you want to, but it's really up to the implementation how that takes place. So the same thing happens for the pending response coming back because it's going to launch DTR, which is going to give a form, and uh, it has to be determined at that point, when should this pop up? So I can't tell you when it's going to because that's how you want to implement it. Best practice. Best practice and get the least screaming from providers and, <laughs> and staff. That's right. I think that's all we have for uh, time for questions right now, but obviously Jeff would be happy to answer some more in the hallway or something. Thank you. Absolutely. If you do have questions about the, the actual hack, I have a lot of partners has a very detailed and a lot of people have read the actual hack. can push, point you to page 552 that says that guy. Yes. And by the way, he said that guide, not that guy. Okay, <laughs> just so you know. So it'll be really clear. They did an awesome job with what's required or not, but if you need some stuff for your business partner, we can, I'm happy to provide you some specific things that you should Thank you. You ought to take him up on that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.